the band were saying, no, we still want to do this and we still want to try that. And then Pete Waterman turns up, as he often would at seven o'clock at night after he's been doing a lot of business and so on. Yeah. And uh, there's a fair bit of arguing going on in the studio. And he comes in, cuts right across it. Uh, Banana Armour was a challenge <laughs> for us. The first track that was recorded with, with, with Stock Aitken Waterman, um, Rick didn't like. Virgin Radio 80s Plus. Phil Hardy, hello. Hello, Steve. How are you? Really good, thank you. Welcome yeah. to Virgin Radio and Virgin Radio 80s Plus. Um, it's a thrill to meet you. I've seen your name on the back of 12-inch records mm. for nigh on like 40, uh, 35, 40 years. You're, yep. you're the man behind a lot of the records that a lot of people have bought, you know, over the years. So you're... Uh, how, how do I refer to you? Remixer, producer? Well, well uh, Pete Waterman named us, and I was the first one, Mixmaster, right. Phil Mixmaster Harding. And a lot of the credits are that. Um, and then along came uh, Pete Hammond and Dave Ford, also Mixmasters, and Tony King. So those of us that were concentrating on the mix side of things, that's the kind of tag that we got from Pete Waterman, which is great because it was it may not have been original but it was fun at the time a lot of the things at PWO were fun you know with all kinds of uh uh slogans and things that, that went along with the PWL empire yes and it was wasn't you know, it it was you know, a factory it was, wasn't it was it? it was named empire and that's what Pete was doing it was empire building we we came in there from working for a year or so at the marquee studios where, where I used to be uh, and after we had this fantastic hit with Dead or Alive, You Spin Me Round, mm -hmm. which we'll talk about in a minute. Well, um, let me ask you, first of all, uh, was it difficult to come up with this list? You've done so many prolific gosh. remixes, and there are so many records out there. Mm. Um, to narrow it down to 10, was that difficult for you, or did you did you know straight away, Phil? Uh, it, was, it, it wasn't too easy. Straight away, I could, I could name it, because I've done a lot of interviews and talking about this era, and, and I've written my book, PWO from the Factory. You have, hold on, wait there, wait there, wait there, wait there. Where, where are we? There we go. And there you can it purchase is. that on philhardymusic.com. Lovely. <clears throat> um, what, what I've done today, Steve, is I've I've kind of concentrated on the, on the PWO mainly in house mixes. You know, we were just barely a mile down the road from here. That's fantastic. But what what it's made me think, actually, uh, one of the choices on here is I could probably do a ten of non. PWL mixes, in other words, non PWL related artists. Yeah, like like we've got on here, Depeche Mode. Yes, not related to PWL. Exactly. But but a lot of people like that and Erasure and you know the list can go on and on. Used to come to us for that PWL remix sound. That sound. Yeah. And it was a sound, wasn't it? It was it, like you knew straight away. It, and now knowing your work, you would go, actually, that's Phil. Or yeah. Phil Harding remix. But the interesting thing within that, I think, Steve, that people tend not to bear in mind, is it's actually stretched across quite a few different genres. You know, so for instance, if we were to play and talk about Dead or Alive, you spin me around, a, a, an absolute high energy gay club anthem. Let's start with it then, because the, yeah. the, the, this is record number one. Like you say, as soon as yeah. I heard this, I was transported to Heaven Nightclub <laughs> in London. This was the sound yeah. of Heaven Nightclub. Yeah. The moment this record starts, and you created this sound, how did you yeah. do it? So Dead or Alive had come to us because just previous to that, we'd, we'd had big club records with Divine, You Think You're a Man, Hazel Dean, and someone definitely at the time turned around to uh, um, to Pete in the studio and said, well, why, why are you here with us? He said, well, I've been in, you know, in the clubs in Liverpool, my, my hometown, and your records are being played everywhere. So here we are. You know, he really had to persuade his record company to, to actually come to Stock Aitken Waterman and work with us at that time at the Marquee. So they came with four tracks. This was the standout track, definitely. Uh, they were a four-piece band. They already had a lot of stuff programmed but pretty much we started from scratch beyond what they supplied and we had a fantastic probably a couple of weeks doing those four tracks but this was the standout track and try and imagine you've got four members of the band you've got three members of the production team uh and myself you know quite a crowded studio everyone's a, got an opinion everyone's got an opinion <laughs> a lot of creative ideas flying around yeah and and the real story behind this record is that is that last day when we'd pretty much finished all the recording uh stock and aitken felt that you know the record didn't need any more on it 
the band were saying, no, we still want to do this and we still want to try that. And then Pete Waterman turns up, as he often would at 7 o'clock at night after he's been doing a lot of business and so on. Yeah. And uh, there's a fair bit of arguing going on in the studio. And he comes in, cuts right across it, says, right, everybody out. I'm going to mix this record tonight. Phil, you stay there in that seat. Everybody go home. Go home. And that called everything down. A lot of people didn't want to go home. Yeah. So off they went. Uh, and I'd all been, all personally, I'd already been working for 10 hours. And Pete said, right, you know, here we go, Phil. And we're going to mix the 12 inch first. And a, a, a lot of people don't know this. You know that. Um, we would always, in those days, those early days, we would start with the 12 inch because Pete Waltman was a DJ. Yeah. You know, in the mega clubs up hear. more. And, and that's what he understood. He understood. DJing, he understood the dance floor. So obviously, uh, Spin Me Round was recorded as a three or four minute song, as you finally would hear the seven inch. But we set out to do a six or seven minute version. Uh, and in those days, it's all on tape, it's editing, you know, and so we would build up the mix. If you hear the intro building, that's, that's probably the last chorus or choruses repeated eight bars or 16 bars at a time yeah with us adding more and me going down physically editing with the razor amazing, blade isn't it? it took us all night yeah still, bet. all night and uh and then the next day the band came in and stock and aching came back in and uh and pete burns was completely blown away i mean obviously you know he was the boss of the band yeah if he was happy if pete, pete waterman knew if we can blow pete burns away full full 12 inch full blast on the studio speakers <laughs> And he was over the moon. Okay. And everybody else that came in, and then the management came down. I mean, I was still there at lunchtime playing the track back to, to, to various people turning up. So this is 30-plus hours for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's play it. You introduce it. It is your mix. It's Obviously, you spin me around. This is the what mix? The murder mix. The murder mix. Let's get into this. All right, so Phil Harding, uh, let's get serious. Bananarama. Venus, the original extended mix I put here on my list in massive capitals, the best version. <laughs> uh, tell me about this, because this is absolutely legendary. I mean, this sound has gone around the world and back again, Phil, and it's thanks to you. Yeah. Tell me, how did you even begin to make a record as legendary as this one? Well, uh, Banana Armour was a challenge <laughs> for us because they were already successful. Uh, and if you look across the acts that came into PWL and the acts that Stock Aiken would have worked with, certainly in that kind of mid-80s period, um, there was a preference by the time we got to Rick Astley and Kylie Minogue and so on, on, on starting with fresh acts. But uh, we had a good relationship, certainly Waterman did, with Pete Tong. And Pete Tong was running his own label at London Records and he sent Banana Armour over uh, a couple of times. So Had they already had hits by, uh, by this Yeah, stage, with then? the Fun Boy 3, gotcha. you know, so a lot of their big hits you would know were pre-PWL. And uh, I think Pete Tong wanted to take them into a kind of a clubbier, you know, let's get out of that sort of Fun Boy 3 sloppy, poppy sound yeah. into something more, more more solid. And it's quite natural for, for Pete Tong. as an, He was a great A&R man, by the way. People know him as a DJ, but he was he was great at this sort of stuff. Quiet, who chose to do a cover of Venus, an old 60s or 70s pop pit, I'm not sure. But the interesting part of the story is that there was no real direction of how do we cover this song, what do you want to do, girls? There seemed to be no real discussion. So, um, so what, you just left to, to do it? Well, I mean, obviously the girls came in and did their vocals and so on. Uh, and all the guitar you hear that starts it off, that's Matt Aitken. He's a great guitarist. And we set about doing basically a straight ahead pop record. You know, it didn't even have a four to the floor dance beat at that point. Yeah. And uh, we were probably on the last day and we'd started mixing. And just down the road here, there's this wonderful pub, the Gladstone, around the, around the back of the borough. This was stage. in the documentary, wasn't it? The Stock Aiken and yes, Waterman documentary. Yes, you saw yeah. them in that pub. Yes. And, and we've just visited there, actually. Um, you know, it used to be 10 o'clock at night, tools down, everybody around at the pub. For some reason, Matt Aiken and I had stayed in the studio and we were finishing this mix. Um, so, so we didn't go to the pub. And certainly my memory was that when the pub kicked everyone out just after 11, uh, Siobhan out of the band came in, put a head round the corner... To, to listen to what we were doing and finally said 
actually, we didn't want it to sound like this. We wanted to sound like Dead or Alive. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> to which Matt and I were sort of, OK, we can do that. Let's power up the drum machine. Come yes. on, guys. And suddenly there's all this action. And and what was a straight ahead boom, boom, pa, boom, 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 type of beat? Suddenly, you know, we were into four on the floor... Uh, you know, the octave bass line from the Dead or Alive record. It was the, the permission you needed. The cowbells, a hand clap. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it worked. And it worked. And that was uh, that was a number one record. This was the fantastic thing. Number one record, uh, not just in the dance charts in America, but in the pop charts. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, it so took over was, the world, this so, so, so that was a first for Stock Aiken Waterman. And f- probably for the first time ever, we had lots of legendary parties to celebrate things. But Pete opened... The whole studio building uh, at the borough there uh, to celebrate being number one in America. Wow. You know, why not? And we had a we had a great industry party. And interestingly enough, so this record and the style and the the sound that you created must have actually really influenced the whole clubbing scene in America because they wouldn't have heard records like this, and then no. they started to produce records like this that then came over here. E- exactly. So it was a real it was a first, wasn't it? It was kind of, you know, dance music, as you probably know, Steve, it kind of goes around in circles. You know, someone's influenced by something and they do their version of it and and, and, and round and round it goes. I mean, if if you look at the roots of high energy, it, you know, it is America. It's you know, Even the Pet Shop Boys admit that. Um, you know, an interesting that Dead or Alive turn up and they wanted to sound like Divine Hazel Dean, but Nana Rama turn up, they wanted to sound like Dead or Alive. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and on the circle goes. But... Um, Things didn't really change in terms of, uh, apart from our sort of princess records, and we did a few records with uh, the Three Degrees, uh, the real turning point was Mel and Kim. And the credit to that, which is not, uh, again, not really, uh, you'll find it in my book, but (laughs) it's not talked about a lot, was Pete Tong. Right, Pete again. Now this is amazing actually because we're going to play Mel and Kim now. So my, yeah. um, I first learned a Pete Tong in about 1988, and mm. uh, my parents got me this kind of stereo stack system. He did a Saturday afternoon show which was called the Soul Session, oh, right, and yeah. it was on Capital Radio. And it, the whole mm. point of it was to break songs that were coming out in about 20 years. You know, yeah. it's like wow, how have, you, have you got this? Yaz is still in the charts with this single, but you're going to play something. So, so you were in kind of cahoots with Pete, were you? And he was working as an A and R man, was he? Yeah, well, I mean, it was he. His uh, influence of um, uh, 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 that connection I talked about with London Records and Banana Armor. Yeah, it kind of grew to. I mean, he must have been enthusiastic about this. That that he would often turn up on a, on a Friday evening, um, and if if you were a DJ of his profile in the eighties, you had connections at record shops around London. Yeah, who would you'd want to be first to get the imports the latest imports coming in yeah and he turned up one friday and i can't remember the exact records he brought in let's say there were three or four of them um and it was chicago house and we already had a track in the bag from mel and kim which eventually got released called system yeah but it had gone to the factory it was getting pressed and pete tong he was so enthusiastic about these chicago house records first time we'd heard anything like it um, and, and Waterman said, we've got to make a record like this. And within a week, we had showing out with lots of uh, samples that, that, that I had managed to... I was going to say, this is, a, <laughs> this is a different kind of sound. This is almost like a, ne- a next chapter this, from this, the lights of This is us coming out of high energy and our flirtation with R&B into house. Yeah. Into and house. how did you do that? What's different about this record than the others? Um... Well, that Chicago house sound was 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 a combination of different bass lines and different types of percussion. Okay, you still had the four on the floor. Yeah, you were still one twenty or one twenty five BPM, but there was something about it that what well, it wasn't high energy, but it wasn't R and B soul. Yeah, you know, because they're, they're 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 two different sides of that kind of one twenty oh, BPM. This record almost has a bit of a hip hoppy start to it, and, doesn't and, it? And there's some of that in it. Yeah. yeah. So there's things on there like a. You know, there's like a brass stamp, down, a bow, yeah. you know, those sort of stabby things, uh, which I managed to sample off of some of the other records. Is that how you did it? Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, and it was all at the mix stage. I mean, obviously, Stock and Aiken have recorded Mel and Kim and written the song. But also, if, if you were to dissect 
the song itself, there's not really a standard verse and chorus. It's just a series of kind of hooks and things coming at you. You yeah. kind of get a verse, but... Um, I think this was made for Top of the Pops. Yeah. All I think of is the neon signs and the cameras <laughs> rolling around and stuff, you know. And they, it were, was, yeah, they were great girls. They were fantastic to work with and they really put that whole visual thing to it and the, uh, 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 and the dance. And I only found out years later that people began to call it London House because, you know, basically what, what again, Pete Walter and great at doing... You know, Dead or Alive's uh, and our version of High Energy is a good example. And this is an even better example of how do you take something that's in the underground, in the clubs, and turn it into something commercial and overground that Radio 1 and Capital Radio will play. And and showing out is a good example, and then respectable. Of after course. It. Great examples of taking a very underground club sound from America and commercialising it. So what are we going to play? <clears throat> what, what mix is this? This is showing out the original mix, original extended mix. Brilliant. And it's worth it's worth searching out just for the hair on the front cover. The hair was just so 80s. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> Phil Harding's here. It's my 80s place. Now, Phil, let's mm -hmm. get serious. This is the only mix of this next song. It's Pet Shop Boys. So what were they doing putting the other one on in introspective? This is um well, I've always, uh, this is the one that I remember yeah. and I love. Um, tell me about this. Yeah, so the, always on my mind. This, you know, this was the one that specifically we did for clubs. Specifically, we I've talked about house, I've talked about high energy. Um, and there was also what was called the Miami sound. Yes. You know, which mainly came out of, uh, 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 you know, the Miami scene, the Florida coast. So it was different to what was happening in New York and so on. And that's... That's what they wanted, the Pet Shop Boys. Yes. At the time that we were doing this remix, they were uh, we were actually co-producing the uh, Eighth Wonder. I'm not scared. With oh, Patrick I Kenzie. love that record. So, so you were behind that? Yeah, Pet Shop Boys yeah. Co-produced it wow. myself and Ian Kerner with the Pet Shop Boys, and it, their song. Um, I can't remember where we if we were doing the Eighth Wonder record, then we did the remix, or we did the remix, and then the uh, you know. Uh, Memory's a little hazy there. With an act like the Pet Shop Boys, let me chuck this question because I've always yeah. wanted to ask you, you this. So they've recorded their song. Yeah. Do they send over the raw vocal? Yeah, they send so you've over. you got the raw vocal and then you build around the track. How does that yeah. work, Phil? So they send over the whole multi track, which is probably 48 tracks worth on analog. And we transfer what we want from that onto a new tape. Plus, we sample things, you know, into our sampler and, and yeah. computers and so on. So. The house sound was still very big at that time. So without any kind of uh, uh, direct request from the Pet Shop Boys or anyone else, Ian and I set about doing a house mix of Always In My Mind. They turned up to the studio, this is what I'm saying, you know, partly to hear the mix and partly because of the Eighth Wonder record, um, Neil and Chris, and um, it must have been Neil. To, Oh, we don't really want this to be a house mix. You know, do you mind a, a, a different direction? Uh, you can imagine how we, you know, we spent three days on Ooh. this doing a, doing a house mix. Yeah. So, uh, so after some discussion, we agree on something more like a Miami type sound, which you know may not come across necessarily on the record. But the amusing thing is that um, we get to the middle eight section of the mix. Yeah. Um, and Neil turns around and says, actually. Why don't you have? Why don't we have one section of your house? <laughs> you know, like a like a middle eight section. Yeah. Uh, and then he had the idea. You, you hear it in the middle of the record of um, "You're always in my house." Yes. Which yeah, is this, brilliant. Which it's Neil's idea. Right. He said, "Put up a mic for I me." I always wonder where that came yeah. from. He said, "Put up a mic for me. I'll go out and say the word house, and then you guys cut it in. So it's always in my. And as we hit house, we hit." The house groove yeah. instead of the Miami groove that the rest of the record is, um, and uh, random, yeah. legendary though, <laughs> isn't it? And you predict where it's coming when you're listening yes, to it. You yes. know, you know it's coming up. We thought it weird at the time, but, <laughs> but it's gone. It's, worked, it's though, gone down it? very well in history. <laughs> um, and the other thing that was great was that even Radio One played this version quite a bit. Yeah, quite a few times I heard it on there. Because we we never did a radio edit, and it started a whole new sound for the Pet Shop Boys, didn't it? Well, it was different. Yeah. For, you know, they they had their team and their one, you know, Julian Mendelssohn and the other Stephen Haig, all their wonderful producers 
who 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 were great, you know, hats off, respect to them, but they weren't really club, if I, if I can say that. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we were we were hardcore pop club remixing. Um, well, let's yeah. listen to it. I mean, this is mm. the Phil Harding original extended mix. It's very special. You must be very proud of this. I am. Yeah, always on my mind, and uh, I like to think that it helped to help them to get the Christmas number one that year. I want to ask you, as we go to Rick Astley, Phil, is there anyone that you never got the chance to remix that you always wanted to remix? Yeah, there is actually. Yeah, and finally, with Glastonbury just gone, and you know they're calling it Rick Astonbury. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's talking about what a wonderful uh, performance from Elton John. Yeah, yeah, would would love to have remixed Elton John. We we did do way back in the early days. We and I can't even remember which track now. We we had a go at doing uh, an Elton John extended mix. It and wouldn't have sounded that weird, would it? Well, it was it was still back in the high energy days. It was pre house, um, and it never saw the light of day. Right. You know, there's, there's a number of things that never saw the light of day at, at, from PWL. You must have some stuff at home. Yeah. That is exclusive, exclusive. Yes. What, I mean, what? A, tell me about a gem at home <laughs> that the world would not know, but you've got that you did. <laughs> well, a great example is the first wet, wet, wet record. And they're another example of where you had the manager in the record company wanted the PWL sound on that first Wet 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 single, uh, and the band vehemently were against it. So th- which song is this we're talking? Uh, we're talking Sweet Little Mystery? Or? Yeah, Sweet yeah, Little Mystery, okay. the first Wet Wet Wet. Right. Hit. And we had a fantastic uh, PWL version and a club version, and it's never seen the light of day. Are you tempted to stick it up on YouTube or something so people can tempted, hear? Tempted, but too dangerous, isn't it? You know, it's <laughs> yeah. too dangerous. So, yeah, there's a few things in the closet like that. that, that Have you ever uh, done any Madonna remixes or anything like that? No. No? No. But uh, I, I, would, I would have loved to have done an Elton John full-on remix, possibly later on, possibly in the 90s, you know, by which time I was working with E17 and yeah. Boys and, Boy, uh, Boyzone and bands mm. like that, and he did a track with Blue... And uh, at the time, myself and Ian Kerno were managed by Tom Watkins, who used to manage the Pet Shop Boys and, and Bross and so on. And I'm pretty sure we said to Tom, because he would ask us the same question, you know, what would you like to do, yeah. boys? You know, who would you like to work with? And we would have loved to have done something with Elton, because both myself and Ian Kerno were big fans of his from, from way back in the day. But... Uh, Never happened. Okay, let's talk about Rick Astley. Tell me about Rick. He was a special part yeah. of the stable. When when Pete Walton was in doing this show, he yeah. told us a story of he went to see uh, Rick's band yeah. and it was just out of luck that Rick was singing that night because he was supposed to be on the drums yes. and knew that there was something special going on and next thing he's kind of like the T-boy, you know, and being yeah. paid. Um, what do you remember about Rick? Do you know Rick? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I mean, he was introduced to us at the studio uh, he was a really young lad, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, young lad. Time? He was he, he he was on a youth scheme, y, YTS or YTS, something. YTS, yeah, a youth training that. scheme, wasn't That's it? it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Pete told us that. The only people that Pete told that he was going to be an artist yeah. were, were Mike Stock, Matt Aitken, and the managing director, um, David Howes. And so, therefore, he was introduced to the rest of us in the studio as the next T-boy. And uh, by that time, we had two or three studios, so there were quite a few... Assistants, you mm-hmm. know, say T Boy, but uh, they're various names. Um, so you know, it was it was no sugar and a bit of milk, please, Rick, and, and that's how it started. <laughs> it's interesting but- that out of all the artists uh, in this Stock Aiken and Waterman st- stable, I mentioned this to you before. I would say Percy is a fan. Rick Astley and Kylie yeah. were probably the greatest vocals you could work with. Yeah, I mean, would you agree? Yeah, once, once, once Rick started singing, we were blown away. So it wasn't a great surprise that to the general public were blown away as well. Yeah. Uh, and the Americans would not initially believe that he wasn't black. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which was funny to us, but, but but there you go. Did you put the tracks out on kind of white labels to begin with so they well, wouldn't have known uh, how, what the artists looked like? Not really. That was just an assumption that they made. Right, at the, on the radio at, at, and stuff. At the time, yeah, and in the clubs. Because, so Rick... Um, talking about Rick and talking about Kylie it's interesting because Rick was still in our period when we were making Pop House or London House whatever you might want to call it but still you know with with roots in house and club records Mm. and 
we hadn't really crossed over to sort of out and out pop, which which finally happened with with Kylie. Yeah. So we we had a lot of support uh, from the clubs with Rick, and in fact, the first record that came out was a duet. If you know, if you're a collector, you might dig this out. Rick and Lisa, uh, and I it didn't was know this. It, it was written and produced by myself and Ian Kerno and Rick. Um, What's the record called? Can you remember? Name of the song was. <clears throat> Can't remember. I mean, I got the, no, read the book. <laughs> yeah. It's in the book. Yeah, it's, it's in, in the, the book. book. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but That's he did well in the clubs. He did well in the clubs, and it introduced Rick certainly in the London club circuit and to uh, Capital Radio. Got behind it, you mm-hmm. know. Um, uh, uh, Mick and we made records with them, didn't we? Mick. Pat and Mick. Pat and Mick. Yeah. And also, just very. This is a very nerdy question. Yeah. But Capital Radio, being a London mm. boy, that mm. was my station when I grew up. They re-imaged their whole station sound as Stock Aiken and Waterman. They were late big, 80s, didn't big they? supporters. Yeah. You know, big supporters. So uh, that 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 record kind of you know got buried in uh, you know it wasn't a pop hit, and. But the interesting thing is that Never Gonna Give You Up was recorded around the same time, written and recorded. Uh, and in fact, on my CD that, go, that goes with the book, um, there's an early mix of Never Gonna Give You Up uh, that basically, and these you know these kind of things happen in the business, that basically was kind of, I won't say rejected, but it was shelved by Pete Waterman. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Stott, Matt Aiken and myself worked hard on this mix. I I think we could probably all feel that there was something missing. So it kind of got put on the shelf, this duet came out, and someone uh, pointed out to Pete that, you know, we, this track existed. I think it might have been played at, at one of our Christmas parties. Right. And he said, come on, let's, let's, let's look at this again. And they got, uh, uh, you know, my production partner, Ian Kerno, a fantastic keyboard player. They got him to bring up his Fairlight system and some other keyboards. And he came up with those wonderful strings and brass that go across the top of it. Yeah. So they didn't exist at one point. But once they came on and some other things were added, suddenly everyone was jumping up and down about the record. But for six months, it sat there with, honestly, people, people and myself not, not thinking this was a hit song. Just gathering dust. Or, 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 yeah, gathering dust or a hit record. And then... And then, you know, then it came to... I don't think people were expecting it to be as big as it wow. became. Why have you picked this one, She Wants to Dance With Me? I've picked that because uh, that's the first lead single off the second album. Mm-hmm. And after the huge run of hits off the first album, big expectancy of, uh, you know, of Rick coming into the studio and doing a, a second album. But um, myself and Ian Kerno produced the last couple of tracks that, that Rick wrote for the first album... And he was exhausted. Mm-hmm. He was exhausted by that time because it, there he was, as you say, spotted by Pete Waterman in a band. But, you know, three hits in a row. Uh, huge in America. Huge in America, all around the world. Yeah. And he was sent out to promote that on his own. And he didn't say no to anything because, he, you know, yeah. young, young lad from Warrington or, or, you know. And he was exhausted. He was He was worn out. So when he finally came back in to do the second album... Um, He'd been writing a lot more songs, you know, and I think he'd said to Pete, I want to do more on my own songs, and I think I can write hit singles. Yeah. So the the first track that was recorded with, with, with Stock Aitken Waterman, um, Rick didn't like. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, there was a bit of a stormy day where he, he, he stormed out of the building, and we all thought, oh, God, you know, is, is, is that the end of it with Rick? Are we... But Pete rightly hung in there you know he spoke to rick uh rick said look why don't you let me go and record some of my own songs you know with phil and ian maybe down uh, we had a different studio down in um uh um south london yeah can't think of the name of the street anyway old kent road right <laughs> it's around the corner <laughs> so we went, we went down there uh in, into it was a man from man's old studio wow and rick had written she wants to dance with me you know, um, and he said, I want live guitars, bass, some different backing singers. We didn't go as far as live drums. But uh, so so we went down there and Rick had written this song and co-produced it with himself and Ian. And when we came back to PWL Studios with it, uh, again, like I was talking about with the Banana Armour record, 
it didn't have a straight on the fours kick, mm. which is always what Pete Waterman would, would want because he knows it works on radio, it works in the clubs. So uh, we had said to Rick, you know, it's it's likely that Pete will want to make a few changes, but we've recorded everything that you wanted to record. It sounded fantastic. Um, and with a few adjustments, like a different bass line and a, and a fours on a kick, Pete, Pete Waterman was happy. And it became the first single for the second album, and sat, and Rick was back in the fold. That was the important thing. He was mm -hmm. then, you know, he 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 proven that he could write a hit single, and went ahead and made a second album, which mm -hmm. which was great. So so I've picked it out because it's one that uh, a hit single that I produced. It's been so great hanging out with you this week. Thank, Thank you, you for coming in. Oh, my pleasure. It's like, you know, this is... Uh, if 14-year-old Steve could have seen him now, <laughs> he'd be like, you know, just yeah. in amazement. I'm chancing yeah. the guy remixed all these... I used to spend all my pocket money on these songs. Wow. It's wonderful. The thing is, I used to buy the 7-inch uh, yeah. editions and then get FOMO and think, yeah. I need to hear, yeah. you know, what the 12-inch sounds. So I would have heard your word. Did you ever meet Kylie? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. tell me about Kylie. No, having Blake. not met Donna, I mean, you know, artists that were coming and going a lot, like Kylie and Jason and Rick, you know, they they were all part of the family and all part of the team. Yeah. You know, and they'd come to the Christmas parties. Rick would come down the pub. Jason would come down the pub. <laughs> don't think Kylie did. But... Um, well, she is, was Kylie as lovely as I would have hoped, you know. She, little, yeah. she looked like... Her. I mean, Pete said that she was basket weaving the first time he saw her and thought that she was a schoolgirl from, you know... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure Pete relayed the famous story about keeping her waiting a whole week yes. before they before they made I Should Be So Lucky. But uh, no, I got to know Kylie fairly well. And the first time I met her, a bit like Pete was describing there, we were having one of our many celebrations that we used to have in the reception area. Any excuse to get champagne and cake out, that was the, <laughs> that, that was the 80s. Yeah. And either it was somebody's birthday or we're celebrating another hit record. Um, so I've come out from my bunker and had a glass of champagne. Uh, yeah, and, the, and there's this uh, little girl sitting in the corner there with no one talking to her, whether she had curly hair at that time, you know, as you might remember from Neighbours. Yeah. And went over and introduced myself and asked who she was and what she was doing because, we, you know, none of us knew Neighbours. Five o'clock in the day, we're all in there making records, yeah. you know. Um, and, yeah, said who she was and... Uh, She's here to make uh, a record with Mike and Matt. And they kept her waiting that whole week until finally she, she got famously into the studio on, on, the, on the Friday. And so the, the, the dilemma, I think, for the boys on the, on the Friday was, you know, what, what on earth are we going to do? We've only got an afternoon to do it. Yeah. And we had this wonderful club promoter that, you know, that was part of the company called Pit Stop. And... Uh, and I wasn't in the room, but the, the the main story that goes out is that, um, you know, one of the guys saying, you know, well, couldn't we give her something off the shelf? Which really, you know, as I say, didn't exist. No. Um, and Pit Stop said, well, she should be so lucky to, to get something off your shelf. And that's how it started. <laughs> and ding. There's you... some different versions of that story, but that's... <laughs> I love it. I that love one's it. been confirmed. I that one. That one's been confirmed three times. You worked me, on so, so many uh, Kylie songs. Do you have a personal favourite, a personal favourite remix of one of Kylie's songs that oh, you did? It, it, it's the one we're going to play. This Step one. Back in time. Tell me about this. Because it gave such an opportunity for myself and Ian Kerno to get really involved. I mean, we did end up uh, producing one track with her, Celebration, mm -hmm. which was one of the latter singles from that period. Um, and we did get the opportunity to write a song with her, uh, which never really saw the light of the day. It's, what was it's, it? it it's, it's I can't remember the title, but it's buried on a an Australian compilation somewhere. Right. Okay. Amazing. Um, Can I ask a really nerdy question? I've yeah. just thought of it. I would always, never forgive Constant. myself. There was. Um, I'm sure it was a PW. It was a dance remix, a Kylie track, and it came out. I think she, they called it Angel K, and it was mm. called Dare. And it, but people were like, it is Wasn't Kylie, it? but it's a club record. Oh, I just right. wondered if you ever heard of it. No. Okay, that would have been brilliant, had that, you. That sounds uh, like a Tony uh, King thing. It could be <laughs> one of um, mix masters. But so this step back in time, this, yeah. this this mix is very much going back to what you were saying about Stock Aiken and Walsham and Motown. Yeah. This is got that vibe, almost you yeah. know, a bit like the other song that reminds me of this is Brother Beyond. The harder I try, yeah. Happy Motown. This is funkier, isn't it? It's a lot Which, funkier, and and it gave the opportunity, as I'm saying, that. Uh, Pete came down to, because we had all these separate, different studios, and he came down to myself and Ian and basically said that um, for this track, and uh, there was another track, we want to get Kylie back into the clubs. So, you 
know, here's the basic radio record that, that, that that's that's been recorded and written. But we, again, going all the way back to Dead or Alive, I want you know, I want you and Ian to do a club version. Um, but all we've got is a rough mix of what we have of the song so far. Yeah. And hopefully your version is going to be the main version, which so how, it ended up being. How did you get the We Want a Funk, you know, the, the beginning bits? Who, who yeah. sung that? Who, who, was it a sample? It's a sample. What, yeah. From where? Oh, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> possibly so. <laughs> <laughs> so. So again, we, we sampled a lot of things like that. And uh, uh, at some most times we've managed to get away with it, not always. Um <laughs> And but the thing is that, that to, to, to those DJs that were into that more hip hop and more funk club sound, yeah, you know, they, they knew the samples, they knew where this sort of stuff come, came from, and it's appealing to them to oh, suddenly you're combining something as pop as Kylie with something that's really, yeah, you know, hardcore hip hop almost. Uh -huh. Um, so that record gave us the opportunity, opportunity to, to, to use a lot of samples that uh, we wouldn't necessarily have dared use. With someone else, but we presented it to Pete like that, and 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 we went with it, and I think that um, yeah, it's got a real happy, as you say, sort of seventies club vibe about it, and it just makes you want to move immediately. Yeah, doesn't and just it? just the way Mike Stocks, he, he's the main lyric writer, the way he's kind of written it in a sort of retro disco, it just you know just yeah makes you want to get up and. And party and join in with it. Yeah. So that that was really a fun record to do because we were given a free hand to add on whatever we wanted without having to get yeah. someone else to approve it. You know. Whereas back on the second album, when I got involved in mixing "Hand on Your Heart," which is a, another great record, mm -hmm. it that, you know they wanted it very kind of a bit clubbier, but straight ahead the way they'd written. Yeah. It. Um, you know, I never quite got to the bottom of whether Mike and Matt thought what they thought of. Such a different sound from what they had actually recorded and produced up in their studio, mm -hmm. but 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 Pete asked for it and and we delivered it, and here it is. Here it is. Step back in time. I just want to say, Phil, thank you so much for coming in this week. Thank you for thank the you. book as well. Oh, pleasure. This is my reading for the next couple of weeks. Um, amazing to meet you, and you, Steve. and um, you know, a joy to kind of meet the man behind all those. All those pocket money, <laughs> all that pocket money I spent on all those songs. So, Phil, thank you so much. My pleasure, and thanks for playing the extended versions. You know, My pleasure, that, they sound that's, amazing. That's an unusual thing within itself. It's made the week. Unless you're in a club. And if you ever want me to come back and do uh, another playlist of alternative Look mixes, uh, you know, I think I think we could do it. I think I'll hold you to that. I think we've got another My 80s playlist week sorted. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Steve. Cheers.